We have some exciting news for you. On Sunday, September 13th at 10 a.m., we're gonna be gathering back again for our in-person services right here at City Church. That's right, Tammy. We now feel after much prayer and wisdom and counseling, it's time to come back home and worship the Lord together. Now, for those of you who don't quite feel comfortable, I don't want you to feel guilty. I don't want you to feel any judgment. We're still gonna offer our online experience for those of you who still wanna remain at home and worship the Lord. Again, we're gathering together in person on Sunday, September 13th at 10 a.m. And we are filled with excitement and anticipation knowing that the Lord is gonna meet us in a powerful way. And guess what? I will be in the house. Yes. So whether you're coming in person or you're joining us online, we pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. And we want you to know we, we love, love you. you. Well, good morning and welcome to City Church. We just want to greet all of you who are here and tuning in online. I'm so excited to be with you today to share the Word of God. And I know all of you are excited about the announcement that was just made with our bishop who is going to be in the house September 13th. I know I can't wait for the date, so mark it on your calendar. Make sure you tune in. It is going to be a powerful time. Man, I don't know if it's just me, but... The Lord was in worship today. I am so, so excited about all of what God is getting ready to do. And I encourage you to just prepare your heart and to prepare your mind for all that the Lord is going to speak to you today. I really believe if you grab a hold of this message in this world, that it will change your life. But before we go into today's message, I just want to take a moment and the opportunity to honor our bishop. He's here in service today. And Pastor Tammy, they are such an example to the body of Christ. And time and time again, the enemy has tried to obstruct the destiny of this church. But when you are a person of destiny, no matter how the enemy comes against you, there is nothing the enemy can do. Though the weapons may form, the Bible says that they will never prosper. And although he has tried countless amounts of time to obstruct this church's destiny and his personal destiny, here he is persevering through all of it. So I just want to take one more opportunity to honor our bishop. So if you would, just wherever you at, give him a round of applause. Amen. Now today's message is entitled Developing Destiny. And if you have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to turn to the book of 1 Samuel, verse 16. And we're going to look at a number of things in the life of David. And what I want to do is give you a couple of keys that will help you unlock destiny within your life because there's this thought and this concept that destiny is predetermined. And while it is, it requires decisions by us on a day-to-day -day basis in order for it to be developed. It's not something that just happens that I trip, fall, and walk into. It's not something that I can just by default enter into. There are decisions on a day-by-day -day basis that requires my decision, my agreement with the will of God that I have to decide to come into in order for it to be developed. And so I want to take you to the story of David. We're going to look at the 16th chapter of Samuel, and we're going to start at verse 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he'll kill me. But the Lord said, take a heifer. And he, said, and he, and he says, I will come, and say, I will come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint me, the one who I named to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said, and he went to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and they said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. 
So it was when they came that he looked and he said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all these the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest. There he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him. For we shall not sit down until he comes here. That's important. So he sent and he brought him in. Now the boy was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. The Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is the one. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Let's pray. Lord God, I just thank you for the opportunity to minister to your people. And God, I pray that you would open the eyes and ears that people may see and perceive with revelation, knowledge, your word. God, I pray that you be upon me, your servant, so that I can clearly extrapolate from the word in such a manner that it will pierce even the hardest of hearts, Father. And Lord, I pray that you would just exalt your name, that you would exalt your presence in every household with every person who's tuning in this morning. God, I pray that you would touch them in such a way that you would change the entirety of their destiny, God. Change the course of their lives and do what only you can do, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. I want somebody say amen. Amen. Well, there's a lot to unravel within this story, but the first thing that I want to highlight is in the very beginning, because here we see Saul, who has been rejected by God, and Samuel, who's mourning over him. And there's something that I want to really, really get into your spirit before we unload all of what God is saying today, and that destiny has boundaries. And a lot of times, we take into consideration that God has preordained something for our life, therefore it must happen. But the reality is, there are requirements that we have to meet in order for destiny to be a product within our lives. Now, Saul was the first king of Israel. And I want to remind you that it was not God's original intent that Israel be ruled over by a king. The desire and the destiny of Israel was that God be their king. But because the stiffness of their heart, they chose to reject the Lord and they asked for a king. So God picked a man from all of Israel and he chose Saul to rule over them. And he warned the people, if you would do this, there are things and challenges that you'll face as a result of it. Yet they still desired to pick a man above God being their king. And as a result, they pick Saul. And Saul is a man who was head and shoulders, the Bible says, above everybody else. This was a large man. This was somebody who was good looking. This was someone who you can look and see that there was a distinctable difference within him. Now, as Samuel goes and anoints him king, he makes sure that he tells them, God has established you on this day, but be sure to remain obedient to the commands that he gives you, for if you do, your kingdom will be established forever. Now that's very important because here we see that it wasn't God's original intent that David rule in Israel, he was a replacement. Now, shortly after, about two years within his reign, he goes to Gilgal, and the Philistines, they make camp against him. And all of a sudden, the people begin to fear because of all of what's taking place around them. And so they scatter. Now, Samuel makes sure that he tells all of what's taking place to Saul before it happens. And he warns him that he's going to go, and in seven days, He's going to return, and when he returns, he'll make sacrifices to the Lord, and he'll tell him exactly what to do, but do nothing until he returns in seven days. Now, when he sees the Philistines, immediately fear begins to enter into his heart because his people are leaving him. And I can understand being afraid when you see the challenges that you face, but he was given a command to do nothing until the prophet returns because God would command him on the next steps that he needed to take. But when he saw what he was facing, 
When he recognized the enemy that he was up against, he immediately began to fear in his heart because instead of trusting in the Lord, he began to trust in his army. And when his army fleed, he was afraid. And so what does he do? He takes the burnt offerings and sacrifices and he sacrifices himself. And immediately after he does this, the prophet Samuel returns and he comes and he says, what have you done? Because you have done this thing and because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God, you will not have an heir on the kingdom. For I have chosen a man who is after my own heart that will replace you. Now, you may not think it a big thing to bring burnt sacrifices and offerings to the Lord, but this was the place of the priest. And what he was doing was really significant of the Canaanite king priest practices. This wasn't a practice that was uh, that was ordained for him. This wasn't something that was even legal for him to bring on behalf of the Lord. This was the priest's responsibility. So the first command that he was given before he even had the opportunity to see what the Lord was saying to him, he immediately goes, takes it upon himself. And because he does this disobedient act, the kingdom is stripped from his lineage. So we see here that destiny has boundaries. There are things that you cannot do. I want you to consider for a moment Abraham. Now, Abraham was promised that his seed would be as numerous as the stars and the grains of sand on the earth. And we don't see this really beginning to be fulfilled until his son Jacob arrives. And once Jacob comes to his deathbed, he begins to proclaim blessings on each one of his sons. And upon the blessings, he allots territories. And with each territory, there's a boundary. Every destination has a boundary so that I remain within my territory and don't enter in what belongs to somebody else. Destiny has boundaries. Amen. Now, as we unravel some of the text here, we see a number of things that I want to identify to you. First, we see the destiny, we see the purpose, and we see the calling of David all in one text. And while these things have been used as interchangeable words, I want you to know that each one of these things are distinct. Now, they all exist within one another, but purpose is separate from your calling, which is equally separate from your destiny. And so I want to take a minute to give you an understanding of what this is, because when we speak about purpose, purpose relates to the current assignment that God has given your life right now. It is the thing that God is calling you to do in this moment and in this season. And we see that because David was in the sheepfold. He was serving his purpose when Samuel came and sought him out. But then we additionally see his calling. Now, calling refers to a vocation. This is that thing that I'm called to do, whether it be your position in ministry, your career choice. Your calling refers to your vocation in life, whereas your destiny, this is what he would become, refers to the preordained events of your future that God has determined for your life. Now, while all of these exist within one another, they are separate from one another. And I want to identify that before we begin to move on. Now, as Samuel comes he anoints this man, and he's about 15, 16 at the time, while there was still a king who was on the throne. Now, I can imagine what David is probably dealing with at this point, because here we have the prophet, and he comes and he anoints somebody. Now, this prophet knew that saw, that saw the king at the moment wasn't a person who was a peaceable individual because he was afraid to even go and anoint this young man king. He said, if he finds out, I'm going to kill him. So I want you to imagine what's going on in this young man's life right now. I mean, David is just a boy. He's 15, 16 years old. He's minding his own business. He's doing what the Lord is asking of him. He's fulfilling his purpose. He's serving in the sheepfold. And all of a sudden, here comes the prophet of the Lord to anoint him as king while another king sits on the throne. And this isn't a peaceable man either. So if Saul had found out about what was taking place, he would probably kill him. Now, I want you to think about all of the emotions that's going on. 
Here he was just minding his business. He probably reserved himself to the thought, I'm always going to be in the sheepfold. And all of a sudden, the word of the Lord comes into his life and tells him there's more within you than you could ever imagine. And he's probably thinking, how can I even get to this place? I'm just a shepherd. Have you ever come into a moment in life where you felt there was something within you that was so much larger than what you can accomplish on your own? I'm pretty sure he was wondering, how am I ever going to be become king when there's somebody on the throne. I'm not of royal lineage. I'm not a person who's of noble nobility. I'm just a regular shepherd. How could I ever, where I'm at, get to where God is bringing me? This is something that probably seemed bigger than he could ever achieve. But I want to encourage you this morning. If your destiny isn't greater than you, then it wasn't God who gave it to you. If your destiny isn't greater than you, it wasn't God who gave it to you. I can remember when I first came to this church, I came to this church in a very troubled place in my life. I came, I was just coming out of prison. I'd spent almost six years in prison. I'm coming out and I'm now facing a new slew, uh, a new slew of, of charges. I'm looking at three separate cases. Each comes with a minimum sentence of 15 to 45 years in prison, all of which I was guilty of. And I just wanted something different for my life. I remember sitting at home thinking there has to be more to life than this. There has to be something bigger. There has to be something. This can't be all that life has to offer. And I know that there are people here this morning who feel the same way. There has to be something beyond what's taking place in my life right now. And I want to encourage you that there is. And I remember coming to church and I remember coming every Sunday. And the more I came, the more the Lord began to speak to me. And as he spoke to me, I began to see more and more and more for my life. But then there came an immediate problem because as I saw what God was doing within my life and as I saw what God wanted to do with my life, I looked at the current circumstances surrounding where I was and I immediately became defeated because I couldn't see how I was going to get there. I couldn't see how a criminal would be on this stage right now. I couldn't see how somebody who spent their entire life moving against what God has required for their lives, doing anything called of the Lord, But here I am today because God found a way. God took me from where I couldn't bring myself and he molded me. He shaped me and he made me into something I could not have accomplished on my own because I allowed his spirit to do something that I couldn't have done in my own strength. I allowed the Lord to have his way. I realigned myself with the will of God and before I knew it, God found me. He took me from where I was and brought me to places I could never imagine. And I didn't have to do anything except walk in the purpose that he's given me. The first thing you need to understand about unlocking destiny within your life is it begins with pursuing your purpose. We see that when the word of the Lord came to David as a young man, it came to him while he was in the boundaries of his purpose. He was in the sheepfold doing what he was called to do. He wasn't trying to get recognized. He wasn't looking for not- uh, for any type of recognition. He wasn't looking to be noticed. He was simply serving in the area that God had appointed for him at that point and at that season in his life. And if you want to see destiny unfold, you have to understand first the purpose that you're called to right now because destiny refers to your future, but you can't get to your future except through your present. I have to do what God is calling me to do on a day-by-day basis before I can enter into what he has for my future because if I don't focus on today, tomorrow will never come. Have you ever tried to drive on the interstate looking behind you? It's a challenging endeavor and eventually If you keep your eyes focused on what's behind you, you'll crash. If you keep your eyes focused on any direction besides what's in front of you, besides right here, right now. If I try to prophesy and and, and turn into a a different corner before I see what's going on, I I prophesy there's not going to be any cars on this street and I make a right based on my knowledge of the future, I'm going to eventually crash. Because I have to see what's ahead of me right now. I have to focus right here, right now, in order to get to where I'm going. And that's where the word of the Lord found Samuel. I mean, that's where the word of the Lord found David. It found him while he was serving within his purpose. Now, this is something 
that I've been commonly asked over the course of my life, how do I recognize what purpose is? Because it's not something that we literally just come, we speak, we ask God about, the skies open up, and all of a sudden it writes out pastor in the clouds. It doesn't work like that. Now, there's some practical things that I want to be able to give you so that you can understand how to unlock purpose within your life. And first and foremost is prayer produces purpose. When you think about the young man, Jeremiah, the Bible says that before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. Now, this speaks of an intimate relationship that preexisted his creation. But if we want to have an understanding of the purpose that God has given our life for whatever season we're in, it comes through intimate relationship with God. How could I ever know what I'm called to do except through a relationship with the person who's called me to do it? But additionally, there are other things that you could look at on a practical consensus that will give you an understanding of what purpose is. Next, I want you to consider your giftings and the things that you are good at doing. Proverbs 18, 16 says, for a man's gift will make room for him and bring him before great men. The things that God places within you, he places within you intentionally so that you can accomplish the purpose that he's given you. Within you this morning, you already have everything that you need to accomplish all that God is calling you to do. He doesn't just randomly assign gifts to you so that you can by chance become successful. He intentionally crafts everything about you, every element, every aspect of your life, and even the giftings that are within you are there so that you can accomplish the things that he's calling you to do. You may wonder why you're good at particular things. The things that you're good at doing was not by accident. The things and the gifts that are within you are within you intentionally because it will help you unlock doors of purpose within your life. Next, I want you to consider what your passions are. In Proverbs, um, in Proverbs 20 verse 4, it says, May the Lord grant you the desires of your heart and bless all your purpose. Now, I've heard this scripture manipulated a number of times and people trying to use it as a magical ticket for God to grant whatever they want, the desires of their heart, their wives, their husbands, the new car, a million dollar lottery ticket. But that's not what the scripture is talking about because you'll notice that when the Lord touches your heart and once you're saved, that your desires begin to shift. And as those desires begin to shift, it's an indication of the direction that God is calling you to do. I can remember when I was, when I was just getting saved and, and I, was, I was very young in the Lord that I was very passionate about people. I've always been an outgoing person, but I've never really cared much to hear anything about people's lives. I mean, my conversation would be high by. I've always been outgoing, but I didn't really care too much to get involved with people on an intimate level. But as soon as I got saved, there was such a passion and such a hunger to not only get to know people on an intimate level, but to help them see where God was bringing them, to bring them from one place in their life to the next place in their life. And even in those moments where I was just getting saved, those desires were an indication of the purpose that God was calling me to. He shifted things in my heart. There were things that began to change that weren't there before. And those desires that developed, developed as a result of the purpose that he was calling me to. Because you can't have a purpose that you despise. So there has to be a passion that exists, a desire to do what God is calling you to do, because that's the strength that you'll have that will empower you to move forward while other people's strength fails them. Look at the passions that God has placed within your heart, the desires for your service in the kingdom, which brings us to the final aspect of unlocking purpose, which is your service. Service is synonymous with with purpose. You cannot have purpose without service. We see that when David was in the sheepfold, it was an act of his service towards his father's household. It was his purpose in that season. But whatever season of purpose you're in, it will always be your service to God and the kingdom. 
So the thought that somehow, some way, your purpose only advances you is a misconception because purpose always concerns the kingdom, God, and his people. Think about the young man, Jeremiah. He said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I set you apart. I consecrated you. I ordained you a prophet to what? The nations, not yourself. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. What he was saying is the service that I have called you to is in the realm of the prophetic, but it is service nonetheless. So if you're looking for purpose, the first thing I encourage you to do after you've prayed and sought the Lord for where I should be is to find where I should serve. Because this is the door that unlocks purpose within your life. Now, here we return and we see something immediately happen and that Samuel leaves and you know where David goes? It's not to royalty school. It's not to the, the kingly household of prophetic wisdom. It, he goes back to the sheepfold. He goes back to the sheepfold for another two years while he's pondering on how I'm going to get from where I'm at to where I'm going. And I know it's challenging sometimes when you have something within you that is so large, you can't picture where God is bringing you. But here we see a very important aspect about destiny, and that's the process of waiting. And as he goes and as he returns to where God was calling him to, he just simply waits. He does what he knew to be his calling and purpose in that moment, and he returned to the sheepfold. Now, I want to bring your attention to an interesting verse of scripture that you may have looked over a number of times, but Immediately, when it became due season, God chooses to bring the young man David in the presence of Saul because this wasn't something that he could accomplish on his own. So what happens is a troubling spirit from the Lord comes upon Saul, and now he has a scenario where he's looking to get this spirit off of him. He speaks to one of his servants, and he says, find me someone who can play the instrument. And his service now begins to prophesy about the young man David and who he would become before he ever became it. And I want to read you this verse. It says, so Saul said to his servants, provide me a man who can play well and bring him to me. Then one of his servants said, look, I have seen the son of Jesse the Bethlehemite who is skillful at playing and a mighty man of valor, a mighty man of war, prudent of speech and handsome in person, and the Lord is with him. That's very important because he speaks of this young man as a mighty man of valor and a mighty man of war before he ever went to war. He was still a young man in the sheepfold at the time, but there was something that the servant saw within David that other people around him didn't recognize. And the Lord showed it to the servant of David, which brought David into the presence of king, uh, the king, and that began the relationship that would inevitably leading and lead to him succeeding seating the king. And so here, I want to exercise the importance of understanding who you are. Understand who you are. Despite the fact that he was in the sheepfold, there was a calling within him. He understood who he was. And because he understood who he was, he didn't have to prove himself to anyone else. When you know who you are, God will allow other people to see it. You don't have to prove it to anybody. You don't have to step past where you are. You don't have to seek recognition because God will bring recognition to you. You simply have to carry yourself as the person who God has called you to be and wait on the Lord. Lord, and in due season, he will bring you where he's promised you. He didn't have to do anything in his own strength. God highlighted him, brought him where he needed to be, and all he simply did was wait on God. But there's a challenge with purpose. There's a challenge because to each destiny, there's an enemy. And we see here that after a number of years of him ministering in the court of Saul, that the Philistines encamp against Israel. And they sent a champion out against Israel who defies all of the armies of God. Now, this person we know to be Goliath, but he symbolizes a restriction or an obstruction to the destiny that God was calling to David's life. Before he could advance and move to the next season of purpose within his life, he first had to overcome the enemy that was resisting him. He had to overcome the obstacle that was within his path. And I want to encourage you today and know that 
where, wherever you're at, no matter who you are, there will always be obstacles within your path. There will always be challenges in life. And this doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong. This doesn't mean that you're outside of the will of God. As a matter of fact, it means that you are within the will, that you have attracted the attention of the enemy and that he wants to obstruct purpose from progressing within your life. But here we see 40 days this champion, this giant, this enemy to the destiny of David arise and he defies on a day by day basis the armies of the living God. Now, mind you, this young man was not a warrior, not yet. He wasn't a soldier. He was just 18 at the time. And he sees that this is a giant. This is a thumb. This is a <clears throat> stain on the army and the image of God. And he begins to ask, who is this Philistine? Who is this filthy, unclean spirit who would dare defy the armies of the living God? And as people began to tell him, a courage began to rise within him because he recognized something more was going on. This was more than simply a person. This was a spiritual entity that was there to obstruct the path of purpose within his life. And so as he begins to recognize the challenge ahead of him, he begins to see this as something that is more than a person. Because within this, I want to show you something. If you look at Genesis really quickly, Genesis 6, because we see that this was a giant. And I want to show you how this was more than simply a person. This was a spiritual aspect of what he was facing. Now, Genesis, we're going to look at verse 6 from the uh, beginning of verse 1. Chapter 6, the beginning of verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass when man began to multiply on the face of the earth and the daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, that they took wives for themselves and all of whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for indeed flesh is yet his, for indeed flesh is yet his days shall be counted 120 years. Now, there were giants on the earth in those days. And so afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bore children to them. And those mighty men were of old, men of renown. We see here that the sons of God, these are those who were cast out of heaven when Satan was expelled from the kingdom, now roam the earth and begin to mingle with the daughters of men, then producing what we see as giants today. So this is a spiritual principality or a stronghold now in these giants that is being represented through the champion Goliath. And here we see that he intends to go and do battle with Goliath. And as he goes and does, and as he goes and prepares for battle, he talks to Saul and he lets Saul know, look, I'm going to fight this enemy. And Saul then tries to give him his armor. And this is something that all of us face at one time or another. We begin to prepare for battle without recognizing the enemy that we face. And if you can't recognize the enemy that you're facing, the preparation will be inadequate. And so now here we see Samuel, I mean, we see Saul trying to give David his armor. And as he clothes David with his armor, he realizes this armor doesn't fit me because it wasn't created for me. It was never intended to be my protection. He can't wage a spiritual battle with the flesh. And so he recognizes that the battle ahead of me isn't a natural war that I'm waging anyway. The battle ahead of me is one that I must wage in the spirit. So he takes off the armor of Saul and he trades it in for the armor of five smooth stones. Now this is significant because me, to me, this represents the armor of God. Ephesians 6, 11, it says, for we wage war, a not, uh, we wage war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. He's saying that it's not the person who is obstructing you, but rather the spirit that's being represented within the person. And if you want to wage war in the spirit, you can only do it by the spirit. So he trades the protection of Saul for five suits, uh, for five smooth stone. Now in in the armor of God, there are five pieces of armor, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shield of faith, the gospel, the, the sandals that carry the gospel of peace. 
and we see that there's the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, five smooth stones, and this is something very, very important that I want to indicate. We know how the story goes. He takes the sling. He overcomes the giant with nothing but a rock, and this rock represents Jesus. This is a representation of the Lord in a way that Jesus has revealed himself in a past experience in the wilderness. 1 Corinthians 10.4 says, In the wilderness, Israel drank the spiritual drink, and the spiritual drink was the water of the living waters, and it was the spiritual rock, which was Christ. So we see that the rock was more than just the rock. It was the Lord who overcame the enemy of his destiny that stood before him. But here's something that's very, very important because historically we were taught that it was the rock that killed the giant, but it wasn't. I want to read something to you that you may have missed along the years that you've been taught this in Sunday school or maybe the times that you've read the story of Goliath. But after David defeats the Philistine, it says that he was struck down. And in verse 51, it says, Then David ran over to the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of the sheath, and killed him. He took his sword, and he killed him with his sword. Then he beheaded him, which is very important. It's significant because the sword plays a really important purpose in what happens in the next moments of his life. Now, really quickly, I want to take with you the last, uh, I want to take you to the last thing that I want to talk about, and that's the wilderness. Because within each person's destiny, we will always see a wilderness. Immediately after he overcomes the enemy that was obstructing his path, he's thrust into a new season of purpose. And he will never return to the sheepfold again because that season of purpose had been accomplished within his life. So afterwards, he's immediately thrust into the service of Saul. He becomes a captain, and the word of the Lord begins to unfold within his life so much so that Saul never now becomes threatened because he sees David and the influence that God has given him threatening his rule and his lineage, so he desires to kill him. He didn't, he didn't do anything wrong. There are times in your life where you will come into challenges, where you will come into problems, not because of anything that you did wrong, but rather because of what you did right. And so we see now he seeks to kill him and immediately he's thrust into the wilderness. And this is a stark reality that we each have to face because within destiny, there will always be a place of wilderness within our lives. Even with the Lord, we see that before Jesus began his ministry, after he was baptized by John the Baptist by the Jordan, he wasn't immediately thrust into Bethlehem. The Holy Spirit led him to where? The wilderness. So we see that this is a place of testing, of proving where God not only prepares you, but he develops a place of faith within your heart. And he also breaks you to develop an anointing within your life that will allow you to possess everything that God was calling you to do. So here we see he moves into the wilderness and within the wilderness, he takes off so quickly that he doesn't even have the opportunity to bring his armor or his weaponry. Here Saul is pursuing him. He's trying to kill him. The enemy is after him. He doesn't know what to do. He is in a place where he's broken. It seems like life is going around in circles. I can't think of how now I'm going to become king when I can't even think of how I'm going to stay alive. It seems like everything that God has told me will never come to pass in my life. It seems like the enemy is attacking me from every direction and I don't know how I'm I'm going to move past where I'm at right now. Lord, help me. And then he comes to the town of Nob. He comes to the town of Nob where he's met by the priest of Helamach. And he's hungry. He doesn't have any food within his stomach. He doesn't have any way to protect himself. And he goes and he speaks to the priest. And the priest feeds him from out of the showbread, the table of showbread, the temple of the Lord, which was dedicated for the holy things. And then something amazing happens. And he asks God, he asks the priest, he says, is there any weaponry here? For I have left in a hurry and I didn't bring any of my armor with me. And then he says, yes, there is a sword, the sword of the champion Goliath. The same sword that was used to defeat 
the enemy of his destiny before would now become the weapon with which he would wage war of the destiny of his current situation. Even in the wilderness, there was a secret weapon that God had prepared so that he could remind him, if I protected you before, if I brought you from it before, if I have overcome the enemy one time, I'll do it again. He wanted to remind David that no matter where you are in life, no matter what obstacles you face, no matter what challenges you're in, I have done it before and I'll do it again because I am with you. And though those weapons and enemies, they may form against you. They shall not prosper because there is a secret weapon that God has already set aside for you that will allow you to conquer the enemies of your destiny. You just have to endure your wilderness. This is where God was preparing his character and he gets to Ziglag, which he stays a year and four months. And within Ziglag, he now prepares for battle because he's with the Philistine army against the Israelites, who has now encamped and prepared for war with the Philistines. Now, the Philistine king would not allow him to go and wage war against him because they thought, well, here, if this young man was with the armies of Israel, what if he defects? So he makes him go back to Ziglag, and Pastor Tammy spoke eloquently about the importance of encouraging yourself, especially within moments of discouragement and doubt, which is where he faced and what he was dealing with at the time. He goes back to Ziglag. We see all that he had obtained within that city, his two wives, all of that was taken from him, the God, and the Lord God restored it for him. But here, the final thing, and we're closing right here, that I want to, that I want to give you this morning is the importance of staying focused. Day by day, we have to realize the need to come into communion with God's will. Because after the events of Ziglag, finally Saul dies, and here we see David anointed king. From the time he was a young man at 15 till his older age of 30, 15 years had went by before the word of the Lord unfolded within his life. And here is where we see people become more, uh, most complacent. This is the most dangerous element of destiny. Because more often than not, we are in a process of waiting until we finally get to the place where we can see God promised us. But then once we arrive at that place, there is still more ahead of you. And you have to recognize the need to come into alignment with the will of God day by day because the moment you lose focus is the moment you step outside destiny's boundaries and you can easily find what was promised to you, promised to another man because you stepped outside destiny's boundary. Now, there came a point after David had been anointed king where he, he lost focus. He goes, and we know the story. The Bible says in the days that the kings were to go out the war, uh, were to go out to war, he sends his servants and Abner, his general. So instead of being in the place where he was supposed to be, he sent somebody else to do what he was supposed to be doing. And in doing so, he became distracted with the young woman Bathsheba. He became distracted with the desires that already existed within his heart. And that is the most dangerous element of destiny. It's distractions. Because if you don't wake up day by day and focus you don't day by day come into agreement with where God is bringing you. You can easily become distracted by a desire that you have within your heart because the enemy will present it to you. And if you're not where you're supposed to be, then you will come out of agreement with God's will and you will, you will quickly find judgment upon your life. And this is what happens. We see that he lost focus and we see that he sins with Bathsheba, another man's wife, sins his most loyal servant to die in battle. Now, the difference here, and this is, some, this is what I want to encourage you with as we close, the difference here between him and Saul, because within destiny there will always be mistakes, and that's okay because God has made a place even for your mistakes. The Bible says he makes all things work together for the greater good of them that love Christ and that are called according to his what? Purpose. There will be mistakes, but the difference between Saul and David is immediately once David sinned, he recognized what he did and he repented and realigned himself. 
Saul tried to hide his mistake. He said, Samuel, if you'd only go down with me so that the people will know that God is still with me. Instead of repenting, Saul never repented for his actions. He only tried to cover them up. But David, on the other hand, saw that he made a mistake. He recognized that I missed it. He sought repentance, got things right with the Lord, and the rest is history. We know that he would go on to be a king of renown. This would be the seed with which Jesus comes through. And I could sense by the spirit that this morning that people are struggling with destiny within their lives. Maybe you don't know where you're supposed to be. Maybe you're struggling with the things that you're facing. You can't see where God is bringing you because of all of the problems that are engulfing your life right now. Maybe you've become discouraged because I've made a mistake. I've messed up one too many times. I don't see how God can use me. I don't see how God can take a person who's made all of these mistakes cause so much problem and turn these things around for my good. I don't see how you can do anything with this broken vessel. But I want to encourage you today that God is still on the throne. I want to encourage you today that there is nothing, there is nothing too great that the Lord can't restore when you align yourself with the purpose and destiny he's calling to your life. God is looking for the opportunity to redeem all of the years that the enemy has stolen from you, but it is going to require for you to realign yourself with where God is calling you to be and to live and exist within the boundaries of the destiny that is set before you. And the moment that you do so is the moment that even the things the canker worm has, store, has stolen will be restored to you. So I want to pray for you this morning. I want to pray for all of those who have been discouraged for all of those who have been dealing with struggles and issues in their current situation that has obstructed their vision from being able to see what's ahead of them. I want to pray for your destiny this morning. I want to pray that God unlocks something within you that will allow you to overcome the giants that you are facing that's trying to resist you from becoming the person who God is calling you to be. So right now in Jesus' name, I take hold of every stronghold. I resist every giant, every obstacle, every demonic force that is trying to come against you in your destiny. I speak life into the things that the enemy has tried to steal from you. I speak encouragement and exhortation in those moments where you feel I can't move past this place. I speak vision to those who can't see past where their problem exists. I speak to your destiny this morning. And I say, let there be life in the things that were dead. I say, Lord, restore the things that the enemy has stolen. Lord, do for them what you have done before and encourage them that in the midst of their weakness there still yet remains a secret weapon with which you will destroy the enemies of their destiny. And we pray for all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, thank you for tuning in with us. It was an amazing service. I'm glad I was able to break the bread of life with you this morning. And we're looking forward to seeing you here at City Church next week.